And so tonight's speaker is, um, is Dr. Daniel Glazer from the Wellcome Trust. Daniel is um, Head of um, Public Engagement at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, he's been there for how many years? Six and a bit. Six and a bit years. Before that, he was, uh, he, he was for 15 years, Daniel was a, a neuroscientist. Um, and uh, during his time at the Wellcome Trust, he's another one of those uh, rare breed of, of, of scientists who found himself rubbing up against artists, um, uh, in both in collaboration and in also in funding um, the, the crossover between the science and arts research. Um, he's been um, presented a BBC science programme, so he's exceptionally good in front of the camera, as I've witnessed today, um, and also has been um, received a, a, a national fellowship from, from, from Nesta, cultural award, cultural fellowship from, uh, from, uh, from Nesta. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Daniel Glazer. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. So. Oh. Good. Well, hello, everyone. Um, this is a very theatrical setup we've got here, and the laptop is very far away. And I'm trying a kind of slightly new thing uh, for me, which is I don't like PowerPoint very much, so I've just kind of set up some tabs on a Chrome browser with some images and videos that I want to show you. Um, uh, but what I want to talk about is interdisciplinarity today, um, and I'm going to use um, some work that I've done over the years and then also the kinds of work that I'm encouraging the people that we fund at Wellcome Trust uh, to do um, to illustrate what I'm trying to say. The as-yet-impossible thing, I mean, you know, it's a brilliant series, and first of all, my compliments, Mary, and my thanks for inviting me, but for getting such a diverse range of people in to talk, um, and, and I feel kind of humbled by my predecessors in the series. Um, as yet impossible, I kind of rather fear that when it comes to interdisciplinarity, it's already impossible uh, not to be interdisciplin interdisciplinary these days. Right? And I'm, I guess uh, if I have an argument for you, then it will be that, that, that we should challenge that. Right? that we should challenge the notion that, especially early in our careers, that we should all be interdisciplinary. I'm going to challenge the notion that the route to success is to do as many things at once as possible. Okay? And I'm going to advance the notion, and I'll come, I'll come to it in a little while, but I'm going to advance the notion that at least from time to time, it's quite helpful only to be doing one thing. Okay? And, and as part of that, then, uh, in describing yourself and your work, it's quite helpful to be able to say, this is what I do. I do this thing, and, and, and here are the lights by which I steer. Here's, here's how I know what I'm doing. So I'm going, to, I'm going to come at that. I should say also one thing for myself. Um, I am, as they say, in transition currently. So I'll be leaving Wellcome Trust in April. And I guess this is partly a plug and partly a plea um, you know, for help in the future. I'm going to be setting up a thing called Science Gallery um, in London. And uh, that's private. It's not really announced yet. Um, but, uh, but it's going to be a, a new space based on the Dublin Science Gallery, which some of you may know about, a place where particularly 15 to 25-year-olds can encounter biomedical science and other types of scientific work uh, in a space that's led by art and design. It's going to be on the Guy's Hospital campus, and I'd love to talk about that with you later, as long as you don't tell anyone, because it's a secret. Um, but that will be through King's College. So, the brief sketch, I'm going to tell you a bit about Copernicus, who, whose image and images you can see behind me uh, because I think it's important to think from a perspective of the history of science what interdisciplinarity looks like historically. Um, I'm going to tell you probably a little bit about um, some potentially gory pictures of the brain, and I'm going to give you a slightly media uh, story about being on BBC Breakfast. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about some work involving dancers, and I'm going to end with some work uh, that we funded around the Darwin Bicentenary. And all of that's going to take less than 40 minutes to enable us to have a chat, and then I've got a train to catch. So that's the plan. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about interdisciplinarity as it was and about disciplinary boundaries as they were constructed. And I'm going to take you back to uh, the time of Copernicus uh, and uh, a fa the famous book he wrote called De Revolutionibus, and you can see versions of it up there. Um, and all of you know that what Copernicus was on about was uh, the fact that the Earth goes around the sun and not the other way around. Okay? And so historically, you know, we think of him and Galileo um, as being about discovering the truth about the universe, right? And that's what they were doing. But, my friends, it turns out that that isn't what was actually going on then, okay? So in particular, there had been models of the universe which had the Earth going around the sun rather than the sun going around the 
Earth uh, in circulation, if you don't mind the pun, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And uh, what the argument was about at the time uh, was not uh, the question of whether the sun went round the Earth or whether the Earth went round the sun, but the question was who got to tell you whether the Earth goes round the sun or whether the sun goes round the Earth, okay? So it was a disciplinary argument that was happening then. And the argument was really between what were called natural philosophers in those days, and I'll talk about labels that disciplines give them to themselves as we go along, but natural philosophers, what we would call probably physicists, and uh, mathematicians, who in those days weren't really called mathematicians, but people who used mathematics. And in the kind of uh, cultural value system of the day, right, mathematics was uh, like um, dancing, right, and uh, elocution as a kind of accomplishment that you needed to have, but it wasn't really important in the way that being a natural philosopher was, if that makes sense. And if, actually, if you look at the, I mean, I don't want to cut too close to the bone uh, in current uh, situations, and I, you know, to, on, on a fabulous university campus as I am, but the salaries that were paid to mathematics lecturers uh, in Renaissance England were, were you know, two-thirds or half of what were play, paid to physicists. Because mathematics was a nice distraction and physics told you what was really going on, natural philosophy told you. And at that time, as we know, uh, uh, as Michel Foucault has called the, the crisis of the Renaissance episteme, basically sure knowledge, certain knowledge only came from authority, and what authority meant was dead Greeks, right? I mean, you know, so, so it was all based on what Aristotle said, and we just kind of accreted layers of commentary on top of that. So the truth about the world was determined by the ancients, and you could fiddle around with your mathematical models if you wanted to. So Copernicus, published this thing called De Revolutionibus. And he was um, a fearful man, uh, and he was uh, perhaps misadvised or advised by a, a Catholic monk. And his preface, he says, this is just, you know, I'm just, this is just speculation. And in fact, it took 70 years for the Pope to index De Revolutionibus, to ban it. Copernicus was never burned, you know, like Galileo or whatever. The book was only banned 70 years later. And after it was banned by the Pope, it could still be circulated legally as long as the phrase is like, and so we can see from this mathematical demonstration that the Earth goes round the sun, okay, were replaced with phrases like, let us assume for the sake of mathematical convenience that the Earth goes round the sun. And there are editions of his works, I mean, like, like that one there, that old book, in existence today, which physically have pasted over one phrase, the other phrase. So they, had, you know, they, they printed a, a thing which said, let us assume for the sake of mathematical convenience that the Earth goes around the sun, stuck it over the bit that said, we can see from this mathematical demonstration that the Earth goes around the sun, and then the book was fine. Okay? So that, that's a very eloquent and you know, tangible, right, in the literal sense, you can hold it and see it today, demonstration of the fact that the arguments then were not about reality, but about who was qualified to talk about reality. Was it the mathematicians or the physicists? And this is a fairly well-established trope within history of science. I, mean, I can give you your references if you want. Um, uh, but what it shows is that uh, you know, culture wars, you know, the arguments about it, are really about professional boundaries, not about truth. I mean, to, so to sort of whiz forward in time uh, to the current culture wars, say, I don't know, uh, biological um, evolution, you know, the sort of Stephen Pinker stuff, uh, which, where they seek to show from biology what kinds of behaviours are natural or not natural. And there is an argument about that, which, which I kind of partly by my sister makes it, about um, how it turns out that most of the arguments advanced from biology are quite reactionary. So there's a lot of kind of rape justification that comes from, you know, uh, evolutionary arguments, or certainly male, you know, polygamy is, oh yeah, it's natural, that that, that should be the case. And so th there is an argument against what happens there uh, in terms of uh, political prescription or societal guidance from biology which is that it's quite reactionary and perhaps being hijacked if you're, if you're a conspiracy theorist by reactionary forces of the right. But actually what gets the goat of the social theorists and the politicians is that it's some biologists sweeping in and trying to tell them what they ought to do. Right? The, the actual arguments in my view of what's going on is about who gets to say what's what, not what they're saying. It's about who gets to say what's what. Okay? Now, what do I mean by who? And this is my point here. By who I mean what discipline do you come from? What is your status? What is your label? What is your origin? Okay. Are you a scientist, an artist, a biologist? And in fact, the theory I want to outline for you here is uh, what I call the fractal theory 
of interdisciplinary boundaries. Okay? So what's the fractal theory of interdisciplinary boundaries? Um, do people remember what fractals are? Fractals are mathematical constructs. They're, they're shapes that have um, information at many scales. So to give you an example of a, a real fractal or a real world object that's like that, the coastline of Britain. If you look at the coastline of Britain on the scale of, you know, uh, well, I didn't get to 1,000 kilometers, it's quite a small island, but, you know, let's say a few hundred kilometers, it's all wiggly. You zoom into 100 kilometers, it's wiggly. You zoom into one kilometer, it's wiggly. You zoom into a meter, it's wiggly. You zoom into a millimeter, it's wiggly. I mean, if you get down to atomic levels, it's no longer wiggly. But there's a lot of wiggling going on, and the wiggling's happening at many different scales. And that's what disciplinary boundaries are like, okay? So the boundary between art and science... Right, is there. But then within science, there's a boundary between biology and chemistry. And within biology, there's a boundary between uh, neuroscience and other kinds of biology. And within neuroscience, there's systems neuroscience and molecular neuroscience. And within systems neuroscience, there's visual neuroscience and there's motor neuroscience, the seeing and the moving. And within visual neuroscience, there's higher brain function and uh, more uh, peripheral visual processing. And within the visual processing, there are the color guys and the movement guys. And actually, the forces that are at work to keep those groups apart are the same at all of the scales. How do we succeed to keep these disciplines apart? How do we do it? We do it by the good old-fashioned uh, in-group, out-group stuff, specialist language, journals in which you only invite your friends to publish, conferences where only the people you know get to come along and certainly get to ask questions, okay? And uh, the use of specialist technology, terminology, access to the means of production. That's how we keep the disciplines apart. Okay? And so these disciplinary boundaries exist at all scales, and they're alive and kicking today, as they were in the days of, of Copernicus with these arguments. Now, there was a difference back then, which was that, you know, somebody can help me here. I always have the argument. When was the last man alive who knew everything? This old story? When was the last man or woman alive who knew everything? I mean, it's going to, huh? <laughs> Bacon, was it? Francis Bacon, I mean, you know, it's a few hundred years since it was possible for an educated man, shall we say man, uh, to, to know everything. But, you know, he knew all about physics and biology and chemistry and aeronautics and was a politician and a man of letters and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't happen anymore because we've got this increasingly rarefied knowledge. But nonetheless, the, your identity, you know, what you are supposed to be, um, is kind of fixed. Okay. So now, what is the use of combining disciplines, and what are the pitfalls of it? All right. Well, the use of it is pretty clear, because if you have people from different places answering the same question, they bring different skill sets to bear. The skills they've developed are through the professional training, you know, the definition of themselves as an X or a Y, uh, but what the problems that they work on uh, are where they converge. And I'll, I'll outline this more in detail as we go forward, but let me start with an example. And I'm, I'm going to, yeah, there's a slightly Mijar example, but then we are on a Mijar campus in the sense um, uh, of, of the, all these BBC studios. And, and, and uh, in fact, beautiful studios you've got here and, and the Granada lot upstairs. So I was on, uh, was on breakfast telly talking about um, a pair of conjoined twins, uh, as we used to call Siamese twins, uh, who were joined at the head. Um, and they had been successfully separated um, uh, by some doctors in London. And uh, uh, I was brought on to talk about what had happened. I knew nothing about what had happened. Uh, and I, in fact, didn't even know that there were any conjoined twins being separated until uh, Sunday afternoon. I think the clue's in the Sunday because they needed someone for the Monday morning and I was the only guy available. Um, and so I came on to talk generically about separating conjoined twins. And um, I, about four in the morning, woke up. I have young children. And, uh, and realized that I needed a, an image to use for it. Um, and so I did a little bit of Googling. And Oh, has it gone to sleep? That's a shame. Let's see what happens if we try and wake it up. Um, I did a bit of Googling and came up with an image uh, uh, of the relevant bits of the anatomy. And this was the... Hmm, OK, well, oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, this was the image that I came up with. Um, and it's from a guy called Thomas Willis. Uh, and it's called, from a book he wrote called Cerebi Anatomy in London. Uh, and it's 1664 is the date of its publication. So Thomas Willis was a, was a biologist um, and a surgeon in those days. And he's immortalized still today um, by giving his name to a structure called the Circle of Willis. And the Circle of Willis is that circle that you can see in the middle. Can you see a, a, you can see a kind of light colored cross in the middle? And then you can see a dark circle just in front of it. And that circle is called the Circle of Willis because it was Willis what found it. And it's circular. And what it is is... It's um, a critical part of the blood circulation, which you, you've got two ascending arteries, uh, the carotid arteries on either side. You can feel your pulse 
if you put your fingers there. That's how you test you know, someone's dead or not. And what Willis discovered was that even if you occlude completely one artery, even if you block one of the arteries completely, blood still reaches both sides of the brain. So you might imagine that one artery feeds one side of the brain and the other artery feeds the other side. And that is kind of true, except on the way up, there is this thing called the circle of Willis, which allows what we call cross perfusion, okay, which allows the blood from one side to go and uh, uh, feed the other side of the brain. We'll maybe come back a little bit to why the blood supply to the brain is important and all that, but not now. So Thomas Willis was the guy who discovered the uh, plumbing of the brain in that sense. And it turned out for these Siamese twins, the um, uh, interesting, well, the problem, I say interesting because I'm a scientist, obviously a tragic problem that the, the, the surgeon faced was to separate the, the plumbing, not the wiring. So the nerve cells, the, the, the electrical stuff was all pretty well separated, but the blood supply was joined together and to separate it out so that both brains got enough oxygen throughout the procedure and afterwards was the challenge. But I knew there was something else going on in my head. You know how you do it at four in the morning, there was a kind of niggle. Um, and I, just, I dug a little bit deeper and I don't know if it's on this image or not. Perhaps it is. No, it isn't. But I did a bit of searching. And does anyone know who drew that picture? You might know. It's not written on it, I don't think. Well, I'll tell you who it was. It was Christopher Wren, right, uh, the architect. So, and, and he was a mate of Willis. And, and, and the kind of media story is I'm sat there on the sofa with, uh, what's her name, Sean Lloyd? Sean Williams? Anyway, the breakfast telly presenter. And she goes... Um, uh, I hear you've brought a picture, Dr. Glazer. You know, they were doing the other thing on the other side of the sofa, so it's always, but I hear you've brought a picture, Dr. Glazer. And I said, yes, that's right. Um, and she said, I hope it's not too gory. And I said, no, it's all right. It was, it was done in, in 1640. And she goes, okay, 1640? And I go, yeah. And she goes, okay. And there's a little pause, and then she goes, um, so who drew it then? And I said, Christopher Wren. And she goes, the architect? And I go, yeah. She goes, Dr. Glazer, you are a neuroscientist, aren't you? Because <laughs> I think they were thinking of that cab driver who'd come in to talk about a uh, thing and been in the wrong car. And I said, yes, and then it went live, and we talked about it. Um, and and it, it, is, it is a picture, okay, which uh, describes the problem that the neurosurgeon had faced and solved for the conjoined twins. And I, I'll say two, two things about it, right? The first is actually, okay, this is still probably the best image to explain to you what the circle of Willis is. And what will the alternatives be? Well, I could show you plenty of photographs of the uns underside of a human brain or an animal brain, right, taken with a camera, all right? It would be quite difficult to get one where the blood vessels were still kind of fully perfused, but that can be done. And also, I could show you lots of imaging of it, and that's kind of, that is quite cool, because there are some imaging techniques which allow you to see the circulation of the blood in the arteries, and you can even occlude one and watch it, you know, stop, and it's kind of angiography, it's called. But actually, to really understand anatomical structures, and this applies to plant anatomy, and human, you know, animal anatomy, what you really want is a drawing, okay? It's, uh, anatomy is one of the areas of learning where drawing by hand still has a role, has an edge over. I mean, okay, you can draw with a mouse or a, a stylus on a computer, but the kind of drawing by hand as opposed to uh, imaging still has a role. And that's because in order to reveal the truth, I mean, this is almost a platonic point for those of you who care about these things, in order to reveal the true, the ideal circle of Willis, you can't photograph it. There is nothing in reality, you know, like the ideal daffodil stamen or, you know, the ideal octopus eye. There is no single octopus eye, no single daffodil, no single brain that captures what it is about the circle of Willis that's important. What you need is somebody who's really good at drawing because their skill in drawing reveals the underlying truth of what you're seeing. If you, I'm actually more of an Aristotelian than a Platonist, but that's as close as I get to platonicism. Right, so to reveal the truth, you need artistic skills. And the only convincing word to describe the beauty, right, the structure of the circle of Willis and the perfusion of the brain is it's architectural. I mean, it is. It's an architectural wonder, this thing. I mean, you know, it's, it's evolved and all. But to, but to describe its function, what it actually does, it is an architectural construction. And that's why Sir Christopher Wren was, was, was a really handy bloke to have on the team. Um, because as well as being an excellent draftsman, he really understood how things were put together. Right. So as Thomas Willis, to, to illustrate your book uh, on uh, the, the, the cerebi anatomy, the, the, ana the anatomy of the cerebrum, the brain. Can I tell a quick funny story? I'd done 15 years of brain imaging and we went for the ultrasound for my first daughter. Um, and uh, they, you know, the cloudy ultrasound thing, uh, you see these little shapes appear. And I said to the 
sonographer, I'm, I've done 15 years of imaging, I'll, I'll just explain to my wife what's going on there. I said, those two shapes you can see uh, faintly in the background, those are the cerebral hemispheres. And she went, sorry, Dr. Glaze, but those, those are actually the buttocks. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> literally couldn't tell my unborn daughter's ass from her. <laughs> Uh, thing. Anyway, so yeah, y you do need domain knowledge. Um, but uh, you know, so to, so to, uh, uh, to illustrate the anatomy, you, you need uh, an architect, right? and that's an effective collaboration. But I guess the point I'm trying to make, I don't think arguably Sir Christopher Wren would have been as good at what he did had he trained principally as a neurosurgeon. Right? I mean, in order to be the person to be able to draw this uh, biology, you needed an architect's training because you know, constructing whatever architects do, arches and then multiple arches and then flying buttresses and so on, gets you to the kind of place, to be the kind of person, have the kind of brain, which allows you to see and, and, and render these structures for others. Okay, so I'm, I'm coming to my convergent, divergent thought. Okay, so that's, the, um, that's the, my two historical examples of it. Let me tell you about some research that we did um, that, that employed... And I think, I mean, you know, you always want to say that you discovered stuff as you went along, and we did. But this was a thing where, well, I wasn't exactly testing the theory, but I kind of knew, thought I knew what I was doing. And unusually for me, it turned out that I did, right? So um, what we were trying to do in the particular studies that we were doing at UCL, and I'll acknowledge my collaborators happily, Julie Grez and uh, Dick Passingham and Patrick Haggard and Beatrice Calvo Marino. Um, what we were interested in was the relationship between seeing and doing. And for me, poisonally, the origin of the question that I was asking came back, some of you will remember directly, the Barcelona Olympics. And funny enough, it's been, when I tell you what I'm talking about, you'll remember it, re-remember it from a commercial. It's had it on the telly, if any of us still watch telly. Um, the high diving uh, in the Barcelona Olympics, the, the pool was on the hills above Barcelona, and um, the board was you know, out from the mountain, and they had all the spectators and the cameras on the side of the mountain, so that when you looked at the person doing the diving, they did the diving over the entire city of Barcelona. And there's, a, there's some car commercial now they recently put on telly where the person freezes in the diving, he dives through the windows of a car that's on its side or something, you may remember it. I could drag it up on YouTube, but I won't. Um, and uh, perhaps I will afterwards. Um, what I remember very clearly from the, um, the fact of seeing it, the description you know, of it from the commentator stayed with me. So I was kind of wowed by the beauty of it all. And the commentator said, that's amazing. He just did a triple back somersault in the pike with two half twists. And I was like, he did? <laughs> really? Um, and then they would show the replay and, and the commentator would go, yeah, a little bit late out of the pike there, but uh, he got the entry perfect. And I was like, well, I could see the size of the splash, but that's about it, right? It would go, and you know. And again, the, the really interesting phenomenon, even when it was slowed down, yes, it was still kind of right? There was no way that my visual system, arguably, could parse, could, could um, decode the movement. And I asked myself, why? Right? Why is it that I can't see this? And I mean, again, facetiously, there was a Seinfeld episode where George is, um, uh, is trying to decide what to do with his life, as he always is, and he says to Jerry, um, I always thought I could be a sports commentator. Um, I think that would be great. You know, you sit there and you commentate on the games. And Jerry goes, well, George, you know, in fact, most of the sports commentators have previously played the sport to a really high level. And George goes, that's so unfair, right? And, but, but it isn't, it turns out. And this is what we set out to, to look at in the experiments. Why is it that having done a thing helps you to see it? All right, I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, how that's true and whether that's true in a second. But how come is it that having done a thing enables you to see it better. So what we needed to do was to set up a situation where we could put people in a brain scanner. And again, it turns out this is all about cerebral blood perfusion. And just, just, you know, postage stamp tutorial about how brain imaging works. Almost all of the techniques that you use in brain imaging, particularly this one called fMRI. MRI is a magnetic resonance imaging. It was originally an anatomical technique that basically uses some quantum property of the atoms, uh, particularly the water atoms in the brain, to reveal its structure. And there was a kind of anomaly in it that uh, the oxygenation state of, of the blood, so you know blood can either be red or blue, depending on whether it's got oxygen on board, whether it's traveling from the lungs to the tissue or back to the lungs. The oxygenation state of the blood makes it muck with the, this is a technical term, with the, um, with the magnetism differently. And so you can see where the oxygenated blood in the brain is. And uh, bits of the brain that are more active demand more oxygen because there's very little local storage. It's like a you know, Tesco local uh, of the brain. There's, there's no back room in brain cells. So if the store is uh, very active, it needs more deliveries to keep it going. It can't draw from its local reserves. And so if you want to see where in the brain is active, you look for the blood supply. And that tells you on the scale of you know, 
tenth of a second or something, where's actors? That's how these techniques work, bu building on the work of Thomas Willis. So we wanted to see which bits of the brain were active when you were seeing things that you could do versus thing seeing things that you couldn't. See which, what's the difference in the brain when you're seeing something you can do versus seeing something you can't. And we spent ages trying to work out how to do that experiment, right? I mean, ages and ages and ages. And we thought of kind of constructing some arbitrary movement system or, you know, training people in something, but we didn't want to watch them learning because that's not what we wanted them to accomplish. And we suddenly thought, dance, dance, that's the thing. And so we worked in the end with a choreographer called Tom Sapsford and uh, the London Capoeira School. We chose classical ballet and capoeira as the two uh, forms we used. And when I say chose, we chose this in collaboration with a choreographer. We spoke to them about what we should employ. And the advantage uh, and the comparability of the two is that both systems, uh, in, in both systems, there's a really good mapping between words and actions, right? So if you, oh, and we did this, if you get a choreographer to write down some phrases in French, I haven't mugged up on them for you, so I'm going to invent them, and then read them out to a dancer, and we did this in the studio, they'll do reproducibly a certain movement, pas de deux, with a, you know, jipe to the left and then uh, elevé, um, you know, and you read that out in a bad French accent, and the person does it. And the same is true for capoeira. So you can describe in Brazilian, I'm really not even going to try to construct any Brazilian phrases, uh, some, some moves, um, and uh, then the dancer, the, the capoeirista will do capoeira, we all know, right, it's this kind of Brazilian martial art dance form, uh, will do it. And so what we had was this beautiful situation where they had these little video clips where the same body parts were involved. And I'm going to try this, I mean, try this, but you know, so, so what the ballet dancer would do would be kind of step to the left, step to the right, and a kick. And the capoeirista would kind of do a step to the left, step to the right, and a kick, right? So it's the same body parts moving at the same speed, but one is recognizably capoeira and the other is recognizably ballet. And we showed those two sets of clips to a whole bunch of capoeiristas and a whole bunch of ballet dancers from the Royal Ballet. And we looked at which bits of their brain were active in the two cases. And I mean, again, I'm not here to tell you about experimental design, but you can kind of already feel, I guess, the elegance of that paradigm because it's what's called a crossover experiment. For each viewer, they're seeing something they can do and there's something they can't do. But you can kind of subtract out the difference between ballet and capoeira by just kind of reversing the activations. You sort of see what I'm saying. It's called a crossover design. I could draw it for you. But it's neat because what that does is to eliminate the intrinsic differences between ballet and capoeira and the intrinsic differences between ballet dancers and capoeiristas, right? And it just leaves you with the difference between seeing something you can do and seeing something you can't, okay? And what it turns out is, and I mean, this is not really the point of my talk, what it turns out is that the, you use the bits of your brain which are principally responsible for controlling movement to help you see the movement of others. Should I say that again? You use the bits of your brain which are principally responsible for controlling movement. How do we know that? Because if they're damaged, you lose the ability to move that part of your body, right? We use those bits of the brain to help us see the movement. So effectively, you're running a simulation of what you see uh -huh. when you're watching something. And you can simulate better something that you can do than something you can't. Okay, so it's cute, nice result, right, in neuroscience. But the point I'm here to tell you is the following. Well, the point, I suppose, the picture. What, what happened? Me, neuroscientist, right? 15 years of research. I know about brain imaging, I know about brain anatomy, and I know about the function of the brain, how it all fits together. Tom Sapsford, choreographer, right? Uh, in the Royal Ballet School since he was 12, uh, established uh, as a young choreographer, producing work, enjoying talking to us, come together in this convergence on a particular problem. Hey, Tom, I've got this problem. I need to construct a pair of stimuli, one of which allows me to uh, see what's going on uh, when you can do and one which can't. And we have this conversation that lasts for half a year. All the different dance forms, should it be um, dancing with someone or not? What about pairs? Should we maybe do sport? In the end, he constructs the stimulus for us. Now, what's the nature of the collaboration? We paid him. We paid him by the hour, right? Or by the day for his time. But in this moment, in this, this space that we constructed, that's what I call Dionysian frenzy, uh, or if you like, also the orgy theory of interdisciplinary collaboration. At a certain point, you lose the sense of who's doing what to whom, right? Everything's allowed, it's permitted in this space. And in that time, in that space, the choreographer gets to say, I don't think you're using the right imaging sequence here, or I think you're, the power of your F-test is, is way, way too high for this. We need to be looking at, or is that really the prefrontal cortex? And I get to say to the choreographer, didn't you think that his arm was a little bit stiff for that last movement? Didn't you think that? And his wrist, I mean, you know, I'm sure when we did it before. Now, there's no, you know, if I walked into Tom Sapsford's studio and told him to play with the wrists of his dancers, I'd get thrown out immediately. And likewise, there's no space for a choreographer to come in and talk about experimental design, except in this bit. 
right? Well, you've earned your right to be there because you come from somewhere. You have a CV which tells me what you know, and you're an expert in that domain. But I've constructed a common task, okay, which cannot be achieved without these pairs of knowledge, but more than the pairs of knowledge, like Willis and Wren, a space where this collaboration is permitted. This Dionysian frenzy. So, so far, so good. And that happens a lot. Interdisciplinary boundaries drop down. We construct new courses for media and cooking, or for neuroscience and sport, or whatever. And that's all fine. But, and I think this is the critical point I want to make, after this convergence in my theory comes divergence. What were the out, I don't know, I never know really. We talk about outcomes and outputs, and I never really know which is which. People, but anyway, what were the outcomes or outputs of this collaboration? Well, Tom went back to his dance work, and in fact, he produced a lovely piece called Hypnos, which was about the movements that people make while they're sleeping, um, uh, which was gorgeous, absolutely fabulous. And he worked with some video artists to produce a lovely thing. And that was really informed by some of the conversations we set up for him with neurologists doing the neurology of sleep, and he got to work in a sleep lab and film people when they were sleeping and all that kind of thing. So that was nice for him, but it wasn't a science piece. And again, some of you will know the work of Wayne McGregor. He did a lovely piece called Ataxia. Uh, he's a choreographer. Um, and uh, his piece was born out of some lovely work he did with a psychologist. who He brought her into the uh, dance studio, and she did some distraction tasks. It turns out that there are some kinds of mental tasks, like counting backwards in sevens, which really bugger up with your ability to control your body. Like, if you're really concentrating on those things, it's very hard to walk along a straight line, and there are others that don't. Distraction tasks are very interesting in psychology. And so she got, he got the psychologist in to bugger with the brains of the dancers so they couldn't control their bodies anymore, just because they were thinking about something else, right? And then used the movements that he saw his dancers doing to construct a ballet about neurological disorders of movement, called ataxia, and he generated an entirely new movement vocabulary, okay? I mean, so that by the end, having done all this crazy stuff, when the dancers just did that with their arms, it was the most shocking thing you'd ever seen. You know, the, the, in, the con in, the, in the movement world he generated as a result of this work, just a straight you know, gesture like that seemed completely novel. But he wore his learning lightly. This was not a piece of science visualization. This wasn't a, it was called ataxia, but it wasn't about neurology. There, was, there were after show talks, but in the piece, there was no guy in a white coat going, ah, yes, we can see from this the grand mal, you know, nothing of that. It was a piece of dance reviewed in the dance pages of The Guardian at Sadler's Wells, selling out uh, an, an extraordinary piece. And in a sense, its origins in this intensive collaboration of two years were as irrelevant as, you know, who Wayne was in love with at that time or, you know, whether he you know, was taking morning walks on, uh, you know, by the sea or in the city, who funded him or, you know, which, which novel he was reading. All of that's really interesting, but the piece spoke for itself. Okay, so Tom Sapsford's outcome from this work was some neurology-inspired stuff. Fine, did well. Our publications were in, where we go? Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. Right? Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience accepted the paper because it was a novel finding about the architecture of cortex, the functional architecture of cortex, which bits of brain you use to do what. So, convergent, divergent. We recontextualized the outputs in a conventional domain. And that was, that was important, because we knew what we were doing. It's not that I'm against hybrid outcomes, but I kind of am against hybrid outcomes, right? So this whole, I mean, again, I kind of banned from my group the word transmedia, just because it's really irritating as a word, but also because it's, it, it's, it's kind of, it's a bullshit domain in which to make work, right? Because it's not really clear what's going on, who, who are the experts. And that's exciting for the kind of Dionysian frenzy generation thing. But in the end, you kind of maybe want products. And let me show you then in the last few minutes a few products that we made through this collaboration. But I'm going to describe them as being recontextualized, okay, in conventional areas. And at Wellcome Trust, you know, we believe that an integral part of what scientists should do is to engage the public. We use broadcast as part of that. And our research six, seven years ago, like many people's, suggested that conventional broadcast was dead, you know, that where we needed to be was in the interactive space, and it, you know, it, was the, it was around the beginning of the process of the, of the digital switchover, and we thought that conventional channels finished. Turns out, I mean, again, you, probably people here know much more about this than I do, but you know, I, the advertising revenue for Channel 4 for ITV is holding up pretty well right now, okay? And the audiences that you get for the, I mean, you, you can't call them terrestrial channels anymore, Channels with a one at the end of them, ITV1, BBC1, Channel 4, you know, those channels with a number at the end, a low number, uh, are still getting big audiences. They're doing it by living formats and all sorts of things. But, you know, it turns out that this, you know, anyway. So we invest in that space. But we were interested in, in, uh, in, in playing with the genres. But to do it, we needed experts in the domain. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, a project we did uh, with Channel 4 a couple of years ago. It turns out that one of the lecturers here did a similar thing to some of your um, uh, hapless students. 
uh, earlier in the year, but um, it's called an alternate reality game. And what we wanted to do was to make some material using uh, uh, the biology around genetic testing, biology and ethics around genetic testing, aimed at uh, UK-based teenage girls. That was the brief. We thought that was an underserved audience. People, weren't get, people in that sector weren't getting enough science content. So we came up with a thing called Roots Game, and I just want to show you around it, if I can wake the system up again. And we did this in collaboration with Channel 4 um, and with a bunch of neuroscientists. Uh, and what we were interested in doing was generating content that would speak to that audience. So the first thing we did was um, to make a game. And I'm going to show you the game. Well, I'll show you the trailer first, maybe, and then I'll show you the game. So here's what the uh, trailer looks like. Is there a gene for a fat butt, or for bad breath, or a gene that makes me funny? I'm Catherine Ryan, I'm 25, I've had two bouts of cancer, and I have a rare genetic disorder. Over the next eight weeks, I'm going to be testing my DNA and finding out how much defines who we are. Can our genes really make us criminals? <laughs> So we've got some quite good coverage for that trailer. And again, it's quite an interesting trailer because it's got some quite video. Catherine Ryan still is doing the circuits right now. She's on um, uh, Mock the Week and stuff. Uh, it's doing, it, it was uh, quite a conventional uh, video, but we mixed it up with a few other genres. And I'm going to deliberately go into territory which many of people here know more about than I do, just you know, to, to, to make myself look vulnerable and approachable for questions, uh, which we'll come to in a few minutes. Um, but uh, what was interesting for me about this, and I speak here as a, not as a commissioner, but somebody who does fund a lot of telly, I've always been really bored by the notion that you make a, w a website behind a telly program. Okay? I mean, that's generally what happens. And I mean, again, what, that wanting to be cynical, too cynical, the big money is still in teleproduction. And what often happens towards the end of a production cycle is that some associate better have a website. And so they'll throw 10 grand at the website at the last minute and, and come up with some Mickey Mouse. I mean, you know, there'll be people here who know what I'm talking about and people here who don't care, but you know, that often still happens. And somehow, the notion of how you en engage people online is kind of taken as an afterthought or thought of as a format. What I liked about this project was that the, the project was an online project. Okay? We had some webisodes with Catherine Ryan that you saw there. And we had this alternate reality game, which I'll tell you about, and some games. And I'll show you one of them now, which is hilarious. Um, and then this, uh, this big mass of material, the tip of the iceberg made it onto Channel 4. So we had a, a week of three minute wonders, which is the slot back then that was immediately after the Channel 4 news, so three minutes to eight. And then we had a half hour compilation that went out in the skin slot uh, around 10.30, which is you know, the only bit of telly which Yalf you know, still watch, um, and, and that was kind of an effective uh, repackaging of some of the content. And that was fine as far as it went, it got big numbers, but it, was, it wasn't an afterthought, but it was a culmination of a whole online project. And I'm still, I mean, anyone here cares or is watching, um, I'm really interested to fund stuff like that. I think that the really interesting thing for online is the production. So, you know, Brian Cox's latest, you know, biology series. I think the online proposition is watching Brian going into the labs. It's his doing pieces to camera, you know, with a handheld about interviewing the scientists. It's featuring their blogs on a weekly basis. It's getting people to suggest. And, and, and those of you who saw Alex Kotoski's um, Virtual Revolution, she did a bit of that, but did it informally. But the notion that uh, what gets people to participate uh, is the production, not the end point. And, and people are, you know, you can actually show the money shot for an Attenborough series. You can actually show the shot of the polar bear eating the baby seal in the trailers. I mean, it used to be thought that you need to keep the good stuff you know, for the program, but no, it's fine, actually. It turns out you can show all of this stuff and then just weave it into the narrative on the night and they still, people still love it. So I think that the online proposition is about the build-up. And, and you know about the 1990 thing? You know, if you've got an audience for a thing, and we found this with Roots, 90% of your online audience are just passively consuming. I mean, they're choosing what they consume, but they're sitting back and watching it, 90%. 9% are sort of actively consuming it in the sense that they blog about it or they uh, send links around or they share stuff or you know they, they forward or put it on their own uh, tube and, th and that's kind of the, the the hook i had in the blurb for the thing about personal digital curation you know they, you make your own digital environment by this kind of process of uh, uh, blogging and, and and tweeting and, and linking of stuff it's you know it's sampling from the stream of media that passes you and again 
if you're, a, if you're a geek, you will remember this phrase I had from Michel Foucault at the beginning in The Order of Things, the crisis of the Renaissance episteme. Back then, before uh, positivism, before Francis Bacon, before the idea that we could make scientific progress, we were all consigned to just annotating. Back in the Renaissance, there were these authoritative streams and we could just annotate them and that's always possible. Bacon said we can find new knowledge. Arguably, personal digital curation, the construction of our own, you know, I am the sum total of my likes uh, on, on Facebook or the, uh, the, the, you know, the aggregation on a weekly basis of my retweets. That's actually a return to a, a, a less personal, a less productive, uh, a more redundant form of cultural creation, one that actually um, denies the possibility of originality, of, of progress in media. But, but you know, it, we just disappear in a sea of retweets, arguably, as Foucault claimed, but we don't want to go there necessarily. But the point is, um, uh, the personal digital curation, that's what the 9% do. And then the 1% are doing the user-generated content, or abs uh, you know, actually uploading uh, stuff onto the sites. And again, I'll say one other thing in passing, just for the geeks. Um, I think the 1% are really important. We spent a lot of money on this Roots Game project so that people could upload their videos. There was a quest, right? And there were some uh, video blogs filmed by actors that set tasks that people needed to follow in order to reveal clues about the murder of the scientific consultant on the program, all fictitious. Very few people, actually, in number, it was around about the 1%, uploaded content. But somehow their role, the 99-1, the 1%, you know, it took about half the budget was to make sure they could upload stuff and to feature it. We had a whole editorial team editing up on a weekly basis the aggregation of the things people had uploaded. Gave the user experience for the others a kind of authenticity. Right? There's a kind of um, a proxy participation. The knowledge that someone like me could have uploaded to this means that I experience it differently. So that's an argument for this quite expensive thing of allowing people to upload. And a lot of the online projects have that. You look at the actual numbers uploading stuff, it's small. Let me show you this trivial game and I'll end on that note because it's kind of my favorite bit of the project. So we wanted to illustrate, um, uh, I'm not gonna say gamification like I'm not gonna say transmedia, right? But we wanted to illustrate some simple principles of uh, evolutionary biology for this audience. And what we didn't do was to get some scientists to make some games, but what we did do was to work with some games designers. And we came up with this brilliant game called Sneeze, which is right here. So what Sneeze is, is a very simple game. We put it on a place called Miniclip. And again, I don't, I'd never heard of Miniclip, and so I don't even know if they're still in business. But back then, it's where all the preteens were downloading their games. Okay? And also, it kind of came just before uh, swine flu, and so everyone got carried away. And the, the aim of the game is to infect as many people in a scene as possible. And so I'm controlling that little green character. Can you see it? Uh, and I've got one shot. I can hit the space bar any time I want. And I should do it at a, in a certain time when there are lots of people in my vicinity. So let me find them. Let's go here. Let's go here. Boom. Four shots. So I've infected one person. That person's now going to infect some more. Uh, and if by the time the game ends, I've infected enough people, I progress to the next level. And in future levels, you get to go to a kindergarten and an old people's home where the resistance is lower and uh, you get more points for infecting and so on. So that's the game. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm there, man. I've, just, I've taken out that whole street. Uh, one street. Um, watching that game infect uh, the lab, I mean, well, the place I worked was brilliant. And you could tell because you could just hear the sneezing around and the giggling. Um, oh, man, that was an addictive game. We had 15 million plays online for that thing. Now, the, the um, uh, New York Times, the whole business, um, the engine okay, that drives that game is a standard you know, flash-based game. I think it cost 8,000 quid. It was an 800,000 pound project, 8,000 quid for the game. It's one of those things. If you could only tell in advance which 8,000 of the 800 was going to be the one that got you the publicity, you could save yourself the trouble of the other 99%, but unfortunately, you can never tell. Um, but it was built by games people. Okay? It was a trivial and disgusting game that they knew was going to be addictive. But the core of it arose from a deep collaboration with some people working on infection. And the model used for the gameplay is the same one that CDC, you know, that, that disease control thing in Atlanta that's in all those outbreak movies, uses to predict the spread of viruses. Okay, a slightly Mickey Mouse version of it. But, you know, the public engagement with science bit is the, the trick was to turn the game player into the virus rather than the sufferer. Right? And actually, this is a very effective way of getting kids to wash their hands. Because once they've realized how easy it is to infect, they're like, shit, what's wrong with that? So, but you, you need to get onto the other side of the problem. But the gameplay was critical. Gamification, which I'm not going to use, isn't about trying to get scientists to be more gamey. 
right? But it's about working with the gatekeepers, with the people who know how to make these big and addictive games, that understand their audience, and just bring them little nuggets, little gems of scientific content. Create mini Dionysian spaces where these things can happen. But for God's sake, don't put it on the Wellcome Trust website. Who cares what's on the Wellcome Trust website? Put it in mini clip. Put it back into the spaces that are owned and controlled by the audiences you're interested in, okay? So are we all interdisciplinary? I fear we are. None of us can really tell where we've come from. But what we should assert is, is, is our knowledge, what we bring to a situation. We should encourage ourselves to collaborate with people that are different from us in spaces where any kind of collaboration and any kind of authority is permitted. But then we should re-describe what we do back in home territory where somebody at least knows what's going on. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I've really enjoyed that, and it, it touches on lots of themes that are currently um, uh, quite deep in our own university at the moment. Um, I'm, I still come back to, though, um, some a quote, a moment that where, um, and a quote from Eric Schmidt, who's the CEO of Google, yep. and he said um, that the next digital media innovations we're only going to come when the lovey and the boffin start to work together. And he didn't mean, uh, at that time, he was talking about being educated in the same space at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so what would your response to that kind of um, idea be? Well, I think, uh, you know, he's got as little idea as the rest of us as to what the next <laughs> digital innovation is going to be. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to oppose that view, aren't I? So I'm going to say that the notion uh, of early... I mean, okay, so what, you know, I'm not going to fight Eric Schmidt with Steve Jobs, but you know this bit where Steve Jobs says um, it's no good doing market research because by the time I work out what people really want, they'll want something else, yeah? But there's something about that. You need to learn something, right? And so this is not an argument against vocational training, and it's not an argument about, uh, against uh, the relevance of uh, qualifications, but it is an argument for uh, craft knowledge, for domain-specific expertise, and for, you know, the inability to do stuff, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 the lack of competence in a particular domain is important. You need to know a thing you are good at. And then you can, you know, you still need to have boffins and loveys because otherwise there'd be nobody to talk to each other. I mean, interdisciplinary boundaries are like membranes in biology. I'm not really a biologist, although I did do neurobiology. I'm a mathematician originally. But membranes are things which, say, wrap up cells. And the cool thing about membranes is that they're partially permeable. They let some things through, but not everything. The best way to get rid of membranes in a biological thing is to add detergents. The detergents are very good at breaking down membranes. And if you add detergent to stuff, then it breaks down all the membranes, and what you get is mush, right? Which is easy to wipe off plates. That's why you use it for washing up. But it doesn't taste very nice. Uh, and, you know, it is undifferentiated. And so I think these boundaries are important. This, this, this semi-permeability is critical, because otherwise you've got no idea who you are. Now, the arguments about who, you know, there was no thing called neuroscience until the 1960s, and already it's combined with other things. But that's sort of okay. I mean, the word scientist wasn't invented until 1830 yeah. by the Victorians who were trying to professionalize everything. That's okay too. I don't <laughs> mind the disciplinary boundaries shifting. That's what culture does. But I, I kind of insist that they ought to be there. There ought to be something I'm good at. Well, yeah, thank you very much for that. That was a very, very, uh, very, very thought-provoking, very good. Um, and I think it bears out sort of my experience. I'm a sort of generalist who works on lots of research collaborations. That it seems to me the key thing that's needed is is not is not that everybody everybody knows a little bit of everything. You've got strong people who really understand their stuff, but then respect the other people. I think mm -hmm. that's the, the Dionysian sort of space you're talking mm -hmm. about is where there's respect, and you can actually um, you can actually be challenging with other people in a sort of safe space. Mm -hmm. um, but I just I just wondered if you could say a bit more about you know, how you create those spaces, because I think that's the trick, really. Yep. That's, the, that, that's, that's where the, the real good payoff is, but it's really difficult to create those spaces. It is really difficult to create those spaces. And I mean, you know, uh, so I, I've, I've run a team that's been finding ways for scientists and people from broadcast and latterly gaming to interact for five years now. And, um, you know, what we've done, what we've become good at is, is finding formats. Right. So, for example, one of the things we tried, it's quite a commonplace thing in this sort of sphere, is speed dating. Right. So we've got a bunch of scientists and a bunch of 
TV producers together and we set up a speed dating event. It was a complete, I mean, I'd swear, it was a complete fucking disaster. It was awful. It was, everybody ended up hating everybody. And, and the reason for it was really interesting, which is that the producer, the commissioners and the producer were used to being pitched at. So they, would, they sat there, and we'd, we'd kind of set up the scientists rotated. There was a, so pretty, and they were like, go on, impress me. And the scientist is like, impress you. <laughs> you, know, why do, you know, well, I'm working on the transmicrobial collaboration of the world or whatever. And the producer goes, I don't even understand that. Impress me. You know, and the scientist was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm moving on to the next. It was just hopeless. They didn't, so what you want is a format that understands the power relations between the different groups, generates safety and you know, freedom to express yourself, but ability to be challenged. And that, the, the craft knowledge, I mean, that's a meta craft. It's a craft of crafts. But the knowledge of domains that you need and the work you need to put in, this stuff is actually quite expensive. You need experienced facilitators. Like I mentioned, we've got um, you know, a dozen scientists and uh, a dozen scriptwriters from Radio 4. We're working with the commissioning editor for drama on Radio 4, Jeremy Howe, uh, who commissions 200 pieces of drama a year. We've got a bunch of his writers locked <laughs> in a country house outside Cambridge for 24 hours. What day is it today? Tuesday, right? Yeah, so they've, they've, they've got kicked out about an hour ago. They've been there 24 hours with these scientists, locked in, um, in a facilitated process to try and get some of the scientific... Now, we're not trying to make the drama of the discovery of the human genome, right? but we're just trying to get a space where the scientists are allowed to explain what they do all day with enough time not to feel defensive about it so that the writers can actually quiz them on it. And it's always the oblique stuff that results in the, in, in the dramas. We've got one probably coming on stream later in the year from the last one we did, Lavinia Green or maybe doing a thing. But yeah, formats. We were talking about office design, design of courses and curricula, design of campuses. It's about generating these spaces for collaboration. But who do you feed in and what do you take out? Back to disciplines. That, that, that's, my, that's, my, that's what my experience is. Um, I'd like to build on that. It's really exciting because recently there was a, a really interesting question being posed on LinkedIn about what makes good uh, innovation yeah. or what, what, would, you know, what is it in, um, in innovation. And a lot of the posts were about the experts and setting up spaces where I wrote, you need a good facilitator mm -hmm. who actually understands. And no one really liked that <laughs> very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we sound like a pitch for work, I guess. That's the reason. Not necessarily, it. but it's often the people in between that glue that, that mm -hmm. can turn that into something. Mm -hmm. So my question is, and you, uh, thank God you said that because I went, yeah, one mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But what is it within that innovation that we band around so vividly that actually loses a little bit of what really is the key? What, what, what is it really intrinsically to innovation, regardless if it's creative or... Um, medical mm. science. So uh, my question is... Yeah, what's innovation? Yeah. yeah, what's at the heart of that? I've got thing? a I just developed, while you were asking that, a theory of what innovation is, um, uh, which is, it's a bit like a good joke, right? So, so there are good jokes and bad jokes. So, so, so do you know how to, I mean, do you know how to, re how to remember jokes? I remember lots of jokes. So there's two ways of remembering jokes. You can either remember jokes based on the setup, or you can remember them based on the punchline. It's like an indexing system. And the, the classic mistake people make in, in jokes is that they remember them based on the setup. So you'll be sitting in a lecture theatre with red chairs and you go, oh, <laughs> I've got this great joke about red chairs, right? There are these two blokes and they're sitting on red chairs, la, 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 and the punchline is about coffee or something. And it's really unfunny, right? Whereas if you remember the punchline about red chairs, but you do the setup on coffee, th there are no jokes in reality here, right? But you say, oh, yeah, funnily enough, talking about this lecture theatre, did you hear the one about the bloke who's making a cup of coffee? da 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 da, -da, -da and he ended up on the red chair. Boom, that's funny, because what you've done is you've taken people away from where they are on a journey. The, the more mysterious, the better. They want them to really doubt whether you're ever going to get back. And then the punchline puts them right back in the situation they are, and that's funny. Okay? So innovation is a bit like that. I think what the mistake that people make with innovation is that they start with what they've got, and they try and build from it. I think you've got to do exactly the opposite with innovation. You are in a place... You know, you've got a problem, healthcare in Salford, you know, immediate surrounding. You've got a problem right here with the people just around Media City. Yeah, there's some issues. So that's where you are. You all know where you are. You don't actually need to explore where you are because that's where you are. What you want to do is start somewhere else completely, okay, in a completely different place and build back from that to the problem you've got at hand. Does that make sense? I could do another analogy on that one for the facilitation. Should I do that quickly? It's a French feminist philosophy joke. So there was... Um, Okay, so this is about public engagement. So there was a friend, of, I was examining a PhD, I was supervising a PhD at the Slade in the art school at UCL, and my co-supervisor was an expert in French feminist philosophy. And she was organising a workshop on a very, very obscure and contentious French feminist philosopher who's still alive called Irigaray. I'm probably not even pronouncing her right. She's really, really contentious and obscure. 
And what she wanted, it was a, a workshop with the experts in the Rigorai from around the world, and she wanted to do some public engagement around it, right, to, you know, for the local community. And what they were going to do was to pick the most um, accessible talk from the professional series and put it in a slightly bigger hall and then distribute some flyers in Bloomsbury and try and get some people in. And this seemed to me to be an approach that's almost guaranteed to fail, right? In other words, no one's going to come. If they do come, they're not going to understand anything. And the people who do come, if they do come, are going to be the kinds of people who are already interested in, you know. The solution I proposed to them, which they didn't do, but a version of it came out, I said, go to the comedy store in Leicester Square, which is a big square in the centre of London, and do a French feminist philosophy night, right, as part of the conference, right, in the, in, in the programme of the comedy store at Leicester Square. Saturday night is French feminist philosophy night. And you get it compared by Joe Brand, who'd be brilliant, and you get, you know, a few of those guys in. And, uh, and maybe even get a speaker from the conference if you want to, but not many of them, because it's a comedy night, right? And, uh, and that's almost guaranteed to succeed, right? Because even if nobody comes, you've still got French feminist philosophy into the sort of thing. If anyone comes and they get anything out of it, it will you know, quadruple their knowledge of French feminist philosophy. I mean, just like it will blow them out of the water. They'll come away knowing 10 times more than they did. Um, and you might even get some people who get some deep points across. So for innovation, it seems to me, you've got to start somewhere else and build back to the problem you're trying to face, not try and solve it from where you are. Does that, yeah. does that help? But you do need the facilitators to do it, because that's a format. Um, so with that Welcome Trust, um, would you say that um, working with the artists, that they um, would agree that artists are qualified to explain reality? Mm. Oh, don't know about that. You might have to ask an artist. I mean, so it's a bit, bit problematic. It's a little bit problematic being a funder, because uh, people often turn out to be very interested in whatever it is you're interested in <laughs> as a funder, <laughs> right? People follow the money. So, you know, how, you know, getting a clear read of what is interesting to artists when you're offering money for what's interesting to you is a problem. But, uh, but, but what is the role of art in the story and uh, access to truth, I think is a really interesting question. The approach we take at Welcome to this is a bit like what the story I told about Wayne McGregor. We want to fund good art, and I think if you look at sci art as a movement, some of you will have heard of it. It's, it's got a, a quite a venerable history, actually. The real bugger of sci art is every time you get on the telly about it, on the news, they go, oh, it's amazing, this artist went into a lab and drew the cells, you know, it's incredible, for the first time, artists and science, you know, it's like, no, actually, it's been going on since 1960, and, you know, there is a more interesting story to tell, which hasn't been told, it seems to me, in, you know, popular media about that. But, um, uh, Sci art, one of the problems with sci art historically was that it was really bad art for the most part. And that was because the scientists were writing the grant proposals and they were putting in 50 quid a day for an artist. And, you know, like they say, you pay 50 quid, you know, you get monkey. You know, the, don't, it wasn't good quality art. So there was a problem with the value, financial value, as I said at the beginning about the, the different salaries that you get, the financial value of the art. And the scientists couldn't believe you'd need to, a thousand pounds a day for an artist, you know but also you didn't have curators involved. So you need professionals in the domain to bring in artists who know what they're doing. And, and the quality, as I say, speaks for itself. What is the role of art in public engagement with science is a question that I would ask in the Welcome Contracts. Con yeah, it just seems that... But, um, but let me answer that and then, then tell me what you think. Yeah. For me, what's interesting about art is that it redescribes things on its own, on its own terms. So you, you put an artist, and this is a stupid overgeneralization, but you'll forgive me. You put an artist, you, you face an artist with a situation she will interpret it. She'll come up with work that, that is about that, but in her own terms. And that redescription of whatever it is you've put her in front of, cancer, you know, brain imaging, whatever, shows it loosens the authority of the scientist. By redescribing it in an artistic manner, it allows space for the public, for non-experts, to start to redescribe it in their own terms. It shows you that you can construct a narrative which isn't owned and controlled by the scientist experts. So does it discover truth? No. Does it allow a gap for people to interrogate things on their own terms? Yes. So that, for me, is the value of art in allowing people to encounter science. Yes. Okay. So, um, so the role of the artist with um, Welcome Trust is to engage the public. Well, okay. So uh, the next talk I'm giving, which is in about three months or two months' time, at a, a gallery of a mate of mine is called um, "Is Finding Art Useful a Problem?" <laughs> right? Is finding art useful a problem? question mark, right? So my mates who commission art stuff for Welcome are very pissed off about the fact that I find it useful as a way of loosening the stranglehold of scientific discourse on scientific truth, right? They find it, they find it very irritating that I think the really nice thing about artists is that they allow the public to engage with science better, 
Right? Because it's what's called instrumental. It's the instrumental value of art. It's doing art for a purpose outside of art. And they kind of believe, as many people who do and consume art do, that it sort of ought to be done for its own sake. Now, I've got no problem with that. And I've even got no problem with my tax dollars paying for that. I mean, I do think it's part of a civilized society that we should fund the best artists. It's just that I also find it useful. So I'm not trying to undermine the artistic project or the value of art by saying I find it useful. And I want people to be nice to me when I say I find it useful. I'm not trying to say that they're wrong or whatever. I'm just saying I find it really useful. But I think it has intrinsic use as well. Um, if I could just go back to the interdisciplinary yeah. uh, discussion. Yep. The choreographer and the neuroscientists are quite polarized in terms of their disciplines. Mm -hmm. If you've got disciplines that are actually quite close together, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking in marketing, you've got public relations and search engine optimization mm -hmm. disciplines that actually should be working together for the benefit of the client and, and, and the marketing challenge, but really struggle to do so. Mm. Not always because of um, commercial territorialism, but actually intellectual. They don't believe that the other one mm -hmm. has any right yeah. to claim um, preeminence in terms of uh, online marketing. Yep. So when you've got that, the, the, the disciplines being actually quite close together, yep. what are you supposed to do yeah, yeah. to get it to work? Yeah. Well, I think it's a beautiful example, and it is, it's an example of the fractal theory of interdisciplinary boundaries. That, and in fact, what it shows is that the closer what you do is to what somebody else does in reality, the more vociferously you'll claim that that guy's doing something completely different. You know, so, and can I quick, the quick joke on that one, the, the Jewish Robinson Crusoe? I'm from a Jewish background, I get to tell the joke. So the Jewish Robinson Crusoe marooned on an island for 30 years, finally rescued, and when the rescuers come, they found these built these two huge structures on each side of the island, made of uh, stones and shells and decorated with palm fronds, beautiful structures, one in each side of the island. And they say, Robinson, what are these structures? He says, well, these are the synagogues. And they say, well, Robin, Robinson, we can understand that you'd want to have a synagogue because you're a religious man and you need to pray and you've been there for 30 years, but why would you build two synagogues? He says, well, this is the one that I pray in, and I wouldn't even set foot in that one, right? <laughs> okay. And uh, so, you know, that's kind of what happens, isn't it? That's, that's you know, we, we need to define the other as much as, in, in order to define ourselves. So I think there's something quite natural about it, and that, uh, as you've alluded to, I think it's an important part of the construction of knowledge and of self. But I think the answer to your question is the answer that I gave before, which is you need formats. I mean, you can incentivize it a bit, right? I mean, you know, so you can construct, what do you want to say, KPIs or something, right, that for a project that, that really can only be delivered if you've got both of them pulling uh, in the same direction. But ideally, you want to find some format, alcohol or uh, an away day or something with a good facilitator that allows them to step down off their horses and, you know, get down and dirty. But then allow them to ride off into the, their separate sunsets, if you don't mind me straining the tw twin sun metaphor too far. You know, um, uh, to retain, as it were, regain their professional integrity. So we're not trying to get away from it, because they are different, for God's sake. I mean, marketing isn't the same as search engine optimization. It's just that to solve this problem, we do need just for an hour, guys, to just get down and solve it, okay? And then you can explain to me why you did it, or he did it, or she did it. You know, does that make sense? But I think it is back to formats and, and maybe uh, uh, incentivization. It's the danger of me drinking and you not. <laughs> I'm properly disinhibited when you can. Thank you very much indeed. Good, thank you for having me.